How many of you, by a show of hands, love a good party? All right. M most of you. Some of you didn't raise your hand, <clears throat> and that's either one of two things there. You're like, I don't know if I can admit that at church. <laughs> or you're introverted, and you're like, I like parties as long as I'm the only one there. And some of you are like that, right? I know, I know a lot of you are like that. So I'm not like that. I'm, I'm extrovert, so I, I, I like being around people. I like a, a good party. If I were to ask you, who is the most famous party people in all the world, don't shout them out, just think about it. Who are some of the most famous party people that the world has ever known? You would probably come up with names like, like Paris Hilton or Kanye West or you know maybe the Kardashians or something like that. Or if you're like me, you're sports minded, you might say uh, you know Johnny Manziel or Rob Gronkowski or I heard that, uh, I don't know this, it was before my time, Mickey Mantle was a big-time partier, for those of you who are old-time, and, and Babe Ruth even before him, big-time partier. So, so these are kind of the people we think about when we think of big parties and, and famous kind of party people. But what if I told you that the, the most famous party person that has ever existed was not any of them, the most famous party person that ever existed was Jesus. And Jesus was a big-time partier. Now, last week we talked about, as we've been continuing our series called Cross and Crown, as we're going through the book of Mark, uh, we're kind of going on a, a slow pace, but we're doing some in-depth stuff in, look, in, in looking into Mark and what Mark talks about in his gospel, which is just a, a telling of the account and life of Jesus. Uh, he, before we get into the party part of Jesus' life, we talked last week about Jesus healing a man who was paralyzed. But before he healed the, this paralyzed man, he forgave him of his sins. And he did that because he knew that that was the number one need that he had. Now, swinging from that, kind of transitioning from that, the, the big idea of the forgiveness of sins was what this section is all about. And we'll get into that here in a moment. Um, but we, what we want to do next is, or as we kind of continue, is to look next at this next disciple that Jesus calls. Jesus calls a new disciple. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to, to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're going to be looking at Starting in verse 13 here, uh, Mark chapter 2 is going to be on 837 in your pew Bibles. If you, um, This is getting a lot of echo. You, are you guys hearing that? Is it just me? I feel like I'm pushed way back farther than normal or something. Um, let, me, let me move away from those speakers just a little bit and see if that makes a difference. Um, but anyway, Mark chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 13. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab one of those Bibles in, in the uh, pew in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible or you have a really old translation and you're not... It's hard for you to read and understand, then, then take one of those home with you, if you would, as a gift from Stellar Christian Church. So let's begin by reading. Remember, we had just finished the part last week about Jesus uh, forgiving a man of his sins and, and helping him uh, walk again. He was paralyzed. He's no longer paralyzed. Uh, chapter 2, verse 13 transitions a little bit, but it's a kind of same thing we'll talk about here in a minute. So let's start. Mark chapter 2, starting at verse 13. He, and he's talking about Jesus, he went out again beside the sea, all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, following at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So Jesus, again, this didn't necessarily follow um, as far as a chronological timeline. Immediately after Jesus healing this paralyzed man and forgiving of his sins, um, it's here because, because Mark and, and also Matthew and, and, and Luke also put it in the same place. But they wanted, I believe, to, to, to show the extreme nature of Jesus' willingness to forgive. Remember, the idea that of, of Jesus healing this paralyzed man wasn't, such a, uh, wasn't so much about him being healed. It was the idea, if you were here last week, it was the idea that he had a sin problem and Jesus forgave him of his sins. And so Mark, and, and as we look in Mark, and Matthew and Luke also did this too, they continue on this idea of forgiveness by, by showing just how far Jesus is willing to go to forgive. So Jesus is teaching large crowds, and a lot, lots of people are gathered. Everywhere Jesus goes, there, there are lots of people gathered around him. And he's at the end of a day here, and he, and he kind of walks by this, this tax booth, and there's a, in this tax booth there's a tax collector working. Now, now maybe, as I read this, I don't know if you guys do the same thing that I do, but as I read, I kind of want to visualize it in my mind and try to understand what's going on and what's happening and, and, and all, all of this stuff. And so I wondered, how is the booth set up? You know, what's the booth look like? And so in my mind, I kind of picture, for those of you who are my age and older, maybe you remember uh, the, on Charlie Brown, they had the, the booth. What was her name? It was a, uh, Lucy had the booth or whatever. Or maybe you think back to the the cartoons that had the kissing booths. And I wondered if the, the tax collector booth is like that, kind of this wobbly old 
uh, rickety kind of a wooden booth where this guy is there taking taxes. Maybe he's, maybe he's beside the sea and he's taking a, a tax on, on everybody who catches fish. They have to come in and weigh them and take a tax. Maybe, I don't know how it works. Or maybe there's, a, there's just a tax if you want to go fishing. You have to pay a tax, which, uh, by the way, we still have. It's, they're called fishing licenses, right? It's a tax on, on fishers. But however it were, maybe he was just taxing people as they walked by. And, and, and you know, as you go by the booth, you're like, uh, hey, you, come here. Have you paid taxes today? Uh, no, well, okay, you owe me. Uh, Twelve dollars. I don't know how that worked. That's just kind of how I, I pictured it in my mind. But whatever it was, I know because I know the nature of people. Because I am one. For those of you who are wondering, it is true. Um, I know the nature of people, so I know that, that they didn't love the tax booth, and they probably didn't love the tax collector in it. We wouldn't either, right? I mean, this is in first century uh, in first century Israel. This is saying it mildly. Most of us don't like taxes. We, we pay the least amount we can. Tax time's coming up. For those of you who didn't know that, you know, surprise, it's time. All right, start working on that. We, maybe some of you have kind of wait and you put, put that thing back and you kind of push. We want to pay the least amount that we owe. We don't want to pay more than we have to. We recognize that, that we, if, we want, if we want roads and if we want police officers and all these kind of things, then we have to pay taxes. So we understand that this is part of life and part of living in a society. But we want to make sure that we only pay what we owe. We aren't really fans of taxes, and we aren't really fans of tax collectors. Well, for the Jews in the first century here, this was, it was it, whatever you think, the worst person you can think of who, who doesn't like taxes, it's far worse than that for them in the first century. Rome was an oppressor. Rome held Israel under their thumb, and they taxed them at, at high rates for anything and everything that they could. Not only did they tax them at high rates and they take in all these taxes, but but the money they collected went toward things that, that the Jews hated, that they despised. And so often, money that the Romans collected from the Jews and taxes would go towards things that, that the Jews thought were immoral, which, again, we can say that that happens in our government today as well. But the Jews felt like they were almost being forced into kind of an, an forced to participate in immorality by the money that they gave to Rome was now going towards immoral things. They hated Roman taxes. But worse than the taxes, was they hated any Jewish man who was willing to partner with Rome and help ta take those taxes uh, from their Jews their, 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 in, the, in the brotherhood there. They hated him. Any Jewish man that took Roman taxes from other Jews was the, the worst of the worst. He was an absolute outcast in Jewish society. And so here we have Levi. Um, Mark calls him Levi. Luke calls him Levi. But it's funny, in, in Matthew, he's called Matthew. And here we have Levi or Matthew, a Jewish man getting rich off the backs of his fellow Jews. And this made Matthew an outcast in Jewish society. It excluded him from, from everything in Jewish life, including uh, worshiping at the temple. It excluded him from, from community. It excluded him from, from any kind of uh, religious activity within the community. And I, I imagine that if we were there in the first century, we would have been we would have been like them. We would have done all that we could do to avoid the tax booth and to avoid the, the tax collector. We might have taken a, a different street, right? If we knew that Matthew was going to have his booth set up right there at that corner, maybe they, maybe they moved the booths around. I don't know. This is maybe a good way to think about it. Maybe that happened. But maybe he had his tax booth at this corner and you wanted to make sure that, you know, I just don't eat at that restaurant because the tax booth is right there. I got I to gotta make sure I go around it, whatever it is. We would do that, right? We would walk down another street. We would av avoid eye contact in the hopes that we could go another day without having to pay our tax. And I imagine that's what happened in the first century. But here we have Levi or Matthew taking, collecting taxes here in the tax booth, and we see that Jesus didn't do that. Most people would avoid it, but Jesus didn't do that. In fact, in all three accounts, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they use the exact same phrase to describe exactly what Jesus did to initiate this, this uh, conversation between the two. Talking about Jesus, all of them said, Jesus saw Matthew, or he saw Levi. Here in, in verse 14, we said, it says, and as he passed by, he saw Levi. Now it takes eye contact. It takes, a, 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 it takes time and an effort to make sure you see somebody. He didn't walk the other way. He didn't take a different route or, or avoid the eye contact. He went up to Levi. He saw him and asked him to follow me. Just as he'd asked the other disciples, Peter, and James and, and Andrew and, and John earlier that we read about there at the beginning of Mark chapter 1. Just as he'd asked them to follow me 
Matthew did that. He dropped everything that he was doing and he followed Jesus. His, his response was immediate. He must have closed up shop. I don't know if he had to do some calculating or you know, close out his cash register. I don't know how any of that worked. But what he did is he shut it down and he followed Jesus. And when he did, his life was changed radically forever. And we know this, right? Because he was one of the ones who wrote a book of the Bible named, ironically, after himself, Matthew. And we should learn something from Matthew here. Paul is another great example. Sometimes those who are are farthest from God have the greatest impact on the kingdom of God when they begin following Jesus. Somewhere along the way, Christians forgot that. You've probably seen it in your life. Maybe some of your friends who you thought would never come to follow Jesus, they they became these radical conversions. They began following Jesus and all the people that they knew and all the people around them were impacted by this one life. God uses those who are far from Him in big, big ways. And as Matthew begins his new life following Jesus, the first thing he does is throw a party. Look at Mark chapter 2, verse 15. And as he reclined at the table in his house... Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and His disciples, for there were many who followed Him. Did you hear the party? No, reclining at the table? What in the world does that mean? That doesn't sound like a party to me. Hey, uh, you guys want to have a party? Yeah, we're going to all recline at the table. What? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Well, well, fortunately, Luke goes into a little bit more detail. In Luke chapter 5, verse 29, it says, And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. Now that's more like it. When I think of party, party and great feast ought to go together with wings, you know, and, and whatever else you can think of, some kind of, maybe some ribs. I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. If anybody, you know, wants to throw a party, this is what I like, right? And that's it, a great feast. Matthew had a, a great feast. He invited Jesus. He invited all his friends. And I'm imagining this, all of this food and and music, and some dancing, and, and probably lots of laughs, and people smiling, and getting to know each other, and talking about the, the troubles they have in their day, and how things are going to get better, and how they hate their boss, and how they can't wait to get away from that, and how the elders are holding them down, and it, well, maybe that's just my parties, I don't know, but, um, but, but, but this is what Matthew did, right? And this is what any person with a lot of money, is. this is the kind of party that they're going to have, and it's impossible to go back and know exactly what Matthew was thinking here, when he invited Jesus to his party, but I like to think that, that he wondered to himself, how can I introduce Jesus to all my friends? How, how can I bring my friends who are far from God to Jesus? How can I get my friends to follow Jesus to? And Matthew decided to throw a party. There's something about a party that allows most people to, to, to open up, to get to know each other, to, to laugh and to have a good time, to make people happy, to get people excited. And so Matthew invited his friends to join him and Jesus for a feast. And because Matthew was an outcast in Jewish society, most of his friends would have been outcasts as well. And so all of these outcasts gathered together for a party. The tax collectors, prostitutes, and other sinners, they're they're at a party with Jesus. And I imagine that, that Jesus is there at this party with a huge smile on His face. Looking at people who are far from God. And I imagine the disciples, the people who follow Jesus, I I imagine them thinking, what are we doing here? Kind of feeling like, I I don't know if this is a good idea. I don't know if we should be here. I don't know if this, I don't feel comfortable. But there Jesus is with a huge smile on His face around all of these outcasts. Christians, those of you who are followers of Jesus, we miss this. Somehow along the way we got off track and we figured that there's a better way that we need to get away from people who aren't like us. We, we turned ourselves into Pharisees. Bob Goff, uh, who wrote Love Does, uh, uh, one of the guys that I admire, I follow him on Twitter, he wrote this on Twitter just yesterday. He said, most of us spend our entire lives avoiding the people Jesus spent His whole life engaging. Why do we do that? Somehow Christianity has turned into avoiding these kind of people with these kind of issues, with these kind of problems. But, but the truth is parties are, are one of the best ways to introduce people to Jesus. We should party. If Jesus was a partier, if we're going to be like Him, we should be a partier too. 
uh, one of the early parties, one of the first ones recorded was in John chapter 2, a huge party where Jesus was attending, and, and Jesus' mom, all of a sudden, uh, towards the, I don't know, three-quarter point of the party or whatever it was, she runs up to Jesus, and, and she's worried because they ran out of wine. And you know what Jesus did? He turned water into wine. Um, John says that there was um, about 120 or 180 gallons of water there that Jesus turned into wine. I've not been to a lot of parties that have 120 gallons of wine. That's a different kind of party, right? You know, I, I know a lot of you struggle with that, but it's not about alcohol. But we can't deny that Jesus was a partier, that Jesus was around people, that Jesus was, was celebrating with people. And as, as Christians, we need to be party people. Uh, in his book, Gorilla Lovers, Vince Antonucci talks about their church having a worship service at a local bar on Tuesday nights. Uh, it's really interesting. The whole chapter of the book is kind of devoted to this. Uh, it's kind of weird how it started out. They just went and they, they had this practice service. It was, it was a kind of a run-through they did on a, on a Tuesday night. And they go in there and they're, they're, you know, they go through the whole service and it was really just kind of a practice, but, but it, was really, it was a service. And so, so there are people who are you know, drinking at the bar and there are people who are sitting at tables and they're listening and watching. And, and there, he said there was one drunk guy who was trying to uh, see if he could play the guitar too or do the soundboard. They kind of didn't let him do that. But, but, all, but here they are having a church service on, on a Tuesday night in a bar. After that first week, the next week, a, a guy who had left the bar crying came back and asked, what it would cost to have a service at his house. And they were like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I, what do you mean a service? And he said, what you did at the bar, we, I want you to do in my backyard. And I'm going to invite all my friends to hear about this kind of forgiveness you talked about. This guy, wanted, they were like, he said, well, how much is it going to cost? And they said, you want to have a church service in your backyard? We'll do that for free. And so they did. They had a service. He invited them to a party where he kind of bait and switched his friends into listening about Jesus. In the same book, they talk about a lady who was uh, from their church who was working kind of uh, at the service and kind of uh, on this Tuesday night at the bar. And, and the, the girl kind of got to know one of the bartenders. And the bartender was a, a, a lady who was pregnant. And they found out that she was a, formerly a, a stripper at a, a local strip club. Uh, come to find out, I don't, I don't know this firsthand. This is in the book. Come to find out that you... Uh, can't get a job as a stripper very easily if you're pregnant. And so she had to get a new job, and she became a bartender. And they got to talking, got to know her. And the girl from the church decided that they're going to throw a baby shower for this bartender who was formerly a stripper. So she got all her friends together, and they didn't tell her it was going to be a surprise. And, and, and one evening as the lady walks in, they all yell surprise, and she was blown away. She said that she thought Christians were against strippers and women who had kids outside of marriage. But because they threw a party for her, she saw the love of God through them. Jesus was a partier, and we should be too. Not so that we can dance and sing and eat, though those are fun parts of parties as well. But more importantly, so that we can introduce our friends to Jesus. So that we can build relationships and get to know each other and, and become friends and, and tell our friends about Jesus. We want to be like Matthew and bring our friends to Jesus. About a year and a half ago or so, we did a, a series talking about how we can do this in our neighborhoods. How we can introduce people who are our neighbors to Jesus. And we ask you to, to, to start having some parties in your neighborhood. And we know, um, I know of at least four or five that we did and then a couple more uh, that are bigger kind of block party kind of deal where the church helped pay for that. And we want to do that. And we have an, an outreach budget and we'll if you want to throw a big party in your neighborhood, we'll spend all of that money we can to, to make, help you to have a party in your neighborhood, to help you get to know your, your neighbors so they can become your friends, so that you can introduce them to Jesus. So many people in our world feel like outcasts, like the, like the stripper turned bartender. And they don't know that Jesus loved outcasts, and Jesus loves outcasts. Jesus loves those who are on the outside looking in. Jesus died for them. We can't be like Him if we avoid outcasts. And we need to remember also that all of us either are outcasts or we were. Our sin put us on the outside of the kingdom of God, but through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is available to everyone who's on the outside looking in. 
And this party that, that Jesus attended at Matthew's house shows just how far Jesus is willing to go to extend His forgiveness. Jesus extends His forgiveness to the tax collectors like Matthew, to the prostitutes, to the strippers, to the sexually immoral, to the worst of the worst. Jesus even extends His forgiveness to me. But the religious elites, they didn't, they didn't do that. They didn't like that. They had a strict boundary set up. There was strict boundaries on who could be on the inside and who was on the outside of God's kingdom. Only those who followed the law, only those who were born into a certain community, only those who, who followed the rules, those are the ones who were considered in. Everybody else was on the out. But Jesus brought radical grace to the outcast, breaking down boundaries that kept them out. And those who were in power in the first century to them, it was all about the religious system that they were in. That was what was important. The religious system, following the rules, following the law, that's what mattered even more than the people themselves. Look at Mark chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that He was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to His disciples, Why does He eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, He said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick... I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, in, in their religious system, you had to be Jewish. Or you had to be a convert to Judaism. You had to follow the rules. You had to stay within the lines. There were lots of laws. There were lots of rules to follow. There were lots of boundaries that you could not cross. And all of these people at this party of Matthew's house uh, were way outside the lines. They'd crossed over those boundaries. They'd gone to the other side. And the religious wouldn't even eat with them. They wouldn't eat with tax collectors and sinners. And when they found out that Jesus was, they were upset that, that He was doing that. Here this guy is claiming to be God. Here this guy is healing, claiming to be of God and from God. And here he is eating with sinners and tax collectors. God wouldn't do that. God would separate Himself. God would pull Himself back. And what these religious leaders were doing was actually making it harder for people to come to God. And they didn't understand or they, they didn't care what Jesus was doing. In Matthew's Gospel, he adds this in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. Um, and he says that Jesus tells them to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came, to call the right, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus tells these, these religious elites, these guys who have studied more, they, they understand the law. They, they're, they're the ones, if you have a religious question, they're the ones you go to. It's like, it's like telling somebody who is a... Uh, has a PhD that, that I'm going to tell you, who I've, I've not gone to school about you, you know, in your field of study at all, but let me tell you, you've got some stuff to learn. Right? Jesus was doing that to them. He's telling these, these PhDs in religion that you've got a lot to learn about religion. And here they had a PhD in God, and Jesus is saying, you don't know anything about God. It's all about mercy, He said. And the idea was not that God doesn't want your sacrifices. Of course He does. But it's more about mercy than it is your sacrifice. It's more about people than it is what we do. And we shake our heads at the Pharisees and we ridicule the Pharisees when we read our Bibles because we're Christians. right? And we read our Bibles and we read about the Pharisees and we shake our head and think, well, how could those guys be so dense? And we do the same things. Over and over we follow the same patterns. Right now in churches all across America, Right now, at this very hour, except depending on time zone, I guess, right? Should have thought about that before I said hour. Right now, in churches all across America, people have a problem with someone in their church service. They've got ratty clothes, or, um, you know, this woman is, you know, she's known to be immoral. Uh, we discriminate against gays and lesbians. They're, they're on the outside for sure. That guy left his wife. What's he doing here? I heard she's addicted to drugs. Alcoholics? Nope. Can't be a part of this. Now, I'm not suggesting that we, that we join in their sin or that we act like that it's not a big deal. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying if we're going to reach people like Jesus reached people, then we absolutely cannot create walls that separate people from Jesus. And like the Pharisees, church people, especially those of us who have been in the church a long time, we try to enforce these strict boundaries on who can join, 
on, on who can serve, on who can lead, on who can be a part of the praise team or, or whatever. We try to set up these boundaries to, to make you get good before you can get God. Jesus never did that. Jesus gives radical grace, shocking grace, grace that goes farther than we can even imagine. Jesus came to forgive sinners. Jesus didn't come for the good people, but for the sinners. And here at this church, we, we've got to create an environment where people are comfortable around us. We've got to create an environment where people who, who feel like outcasts everywhere else can feel comfortable here. And we got to love people. That's how that change begins. It's, it's, it's letting people know that we care. We don't want to jump in and, and have them change right away. Change happens when they learn to know Jesus and get to know Jesus and follow Him. That's when change happens. When we say you have to clean up your clothes, you have to clean up your act, you have to do this before we can introduce you to Jesus, we're not following Jesus. The church is a hospital for sick people. <laughs> that was funny. That's ironic, right? <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. Yeah. A different kind of sick. The church is a hospital for sick people. Uh, and just so you know, all of us are sick. None of us are righteous. And those of us who think we are, then, then we're the ones with the biggest problems. At some point, Christians, us, we became these Pharisees. And we taught our children that you have to follow the rules. There are boundaries that you can go in, but you can't go out. These are the way that you do things. We, we taught our kids that, that, that God is watching, that if you want God to be happy with you, then, then you've got to be good. And, and, and we've turned God into some kind of uh, cosmic Santa Claus. Who, 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 if we're good, God is happy with us and He puts something in our stocking. And, and as we grow up, it's not a stocking, it's our checking account, or we get a new car, or God's happy with us because uh, we did that nice thing, and so... Uh, he helped us move into that bigger house. And we wonder why so many people reject Christianity and reject the church. So you don't, you don't need Christianity to be good. If, if we teach people that Christianity is about being good so God can be happy with us, you don't need Christianity to be good. There are lots of good people uh, who aren't Christians. There are lots of good people, by, and by, by good I mean compared to others, there are lots of good people who don't even believe in God. You, you, you don't need Christianity to be good. You, you don't need the church to be good. If, if we teach our kids that, that for God to be pleased with us, you have to be good and you have to follow the rules and you have to live within these boundaries, it's no wonder they reject Christianity. I reject that kind of Christianity too. I reject that kind of be good Christianity where God is happy with us only when we're, when we're good. See, this understanding of Christianity is not Christianity at all. This kind of understanding of, of be good because God is watching religion is, is a graceless religion that sets up boundaries and counts people as either in or out. The Pharisees imposed this kind of religion on people. But Jesus brought grace. Jesus brought grace for the tax collector. He brought grace for the prostitutes. He, he brought grace for the alcoholic. He, he brought grace even for you and me. Because God loves us and He wants us to be near Him. We taught our kids to be good, that our goal in life is to be happy, and that's not Christianity at all. 43% of millennials say they're spiritual, but not religious. 43% of millennials say they're spiritual, but not religious. And again, we wonder, what is wrong with this generation? What is wrong with the millennials? You know what's wrong with them? That's what we taught them. We taught them to follow a religion, but not Christ. It has nothing to do with the grace of God through Jesus. Jesus didn't come to earth as a baby. He didn't come to live a sinless life and die a death on a cross and, and rise from the dead to make us nice people. And Jesus didn't do all of those things so that we would be good or so that we would be happy. Jesus lived and died on the cross and rose again so that we could be forgiven. This is radical grace. He reaches out past boundaries, through walls, and brings the outsiders in. And you know what? He's still doing that. 
He offers this radical grace. He offers this forgiveness to all people, regardless of our past. It doesn't matter what you've done before. It doesn't matter what's gone on in your life. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of uh, religious groups accept you or not. Jesus does. And that's all that really matters. In a moment, we're going to sing a song and pray a prayer, and, and we kind of use this time as a, a time of reflection. And my hope for, for many of you who have been Christians for a really long time is that, is that you use this time to, to think about your discipleship challenge. Where are you going with this? What is going on in your life? Maybe it's a call to, to, to be more evangelistic in your life, to tell your friends and neighbors and co-workers uh, about Jesus, about the love of God and the grace of God through Christ. Uh, my prayer is certainly as, as Christian parents and grandparents that, that one of the things we watch out for is not teaching our kids that, that Christianity is a religion about being good. It's, it's not that at all. Now our lives change when we follow Jesus and we love God because of His grace and that, that changes us and it changes the way we live and act. But, but getting into God's grace has nothing to do with our behavior. My prayer is that we teach our kids and grandkids that. That we're reminded of that ourselves. And maybe for some of you, uh, you feel like outcasts. I, I hope that's not so. I hope that, that this is a place where, where people who are on the outside feel welcome. Or people who feel like they're on the outside can, can come in and, and be a part. Uh, my prayer is if, you, if you're not following Jesus, then you take this time to take those first steps. I'll be standing here uh, during this song that we sing and and you can come and talk to me about following Jesus, or if you have a prayer request, or, or anything else on your mind, you can come talk to me. If you don't want to do that, see me after. I, I want to tell you about what it's like, about life-changing, uh, radical grace of God through Jesus. So let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your goodness and Your love. And thank You for Jesus who loved outcasts, Father, I pray that we would be like that as a people. That, that You would put it on our hearts to, to go after people who feel like they're, they're on the outskirts of society. God, I pray that, that, that this place, that this church, this local body of believers would become um, not a museum to the, to the saints, but, but a hospital for sinners and outcasts and the lost. God, help us to be that. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, that, that today would be the day that they take those first steps toward following You. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.